around uh, wondering why they could not get an answer to their prayer. And Jesus came and he cast out the demon. But it seems, you know, that the question, does prayer work, has been on many minds. Many of us have probably struggled with that question. And uh, I noticed that uh, the uh, cynics of Christianity quite often mock Christians for the idea of prayer in the first place. Because we say that we have an all-knowing God, so why do we try to inform him? Or if he is all-powerful, do our prayers somehow enable him to do something? Or if uh, he is good, why do we have to ask him to do something that is good? And these are fair questions, and I think that we, we all sense that kind of tension in, in the whole idea of prayer. And maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Um, but you know, when we ask the question, does prayer work? Part of the conundrum is in the question itself. Does it work? It's kind of like asking whether friendship works. Uh, in other words, if you are going into it, into a friendship with the idea of what you can get out of it, uh, that's kind of a mercenary kind of thing, and it usually won't work in that case. But if you enter into a friendship with the right motive, everybody seems to get more out than they put in. And so it is with the, with the walk of faith and with Christianity. Um, but the other idea, you know, when, when, when we think of uh, does prayer work, is it's kind of a mechanistic kind of a question. Uh, it's like a, a machine where if you have, uh, if you can find a promise in the Bible and then you can uh, uh, put it in the slot and then pull the handle by faith, then automatically the answer rolls out like some kind of a cosmic gumball machine. That is not the proper way of looking at faith and looking at answers to prayer. And yet, you know, there is the whole idea that prayer does work sometimes to some people. Um, you know, prayer um, does not deliver the answer. God delivers the answer. Uh, all our prayers for Hannah when she had stage four cancer did not cure her of cancer. God did. Nevertheless, prayer obviously had uh, an important part in the process. And so, uh, you know, so did some practical work on, our, on uh, an effort in that direction. So what is the part that prayer uh, plays in this whole uh, scenario? And, uh, you know, I, th I think probably most of you have read books uh, like by uh, Roger Mano, um, Morneau, I think it is, uh, where he talks about all the answers to prayer. And so you come away with the, from the book with the idea, well, yes, prayer does work so long as you're Roger Mano. Uh, does God have favorites? Does he choose some people to answer their prayers and some people not? Um, I'm mystified by that question because I happen to be one of those people to whom God answers prayers all the time. I've received far more than my share. And trust me, I know very well that I don't deserve it. Um, in fact... It seems to me sometimes that people who deserve it the most are the least likely to receive answers to prayer. Um, I assume that John the Baptist was praying, and so was his disciples. And yet, he suffered and died within walking distance of Jesus. Um, and I have kind of come to the conclusion that some people 
have enough faith not to receive the answer that they prefer. Uh, John's faith was not dependent on receiving that particular answer. And uh, sometimes God has other plans in mind. When we, when we come to God, we don't come to Him to give Him directives. We come with a prayer of request. And the request implies that the answer may be no. So let's put that down as uh, fact number one. Answers to prayer seem to have no direct correlation to what one might deserve. Which can be comforting, I think, to, to people like me. But that seems probably contradictory to many because, uh, you know, fact number two is that answer to prayer does have a direct correlation to faith. And uh, so, doesn't it follow that the condition of having faith causes one to uh, deserve having one's prayers answered? And I say absolutely not. Faith itself is a gift from God. And the gift of faith has nothing to do with deserving. In fact, uh, faith is partially the uh, least a uh, recognition that I deserve nothing at all. But let's do a thought exercise. Suppose that you were going away for a long time, an indefinite period, and you had to leave your family in the care of somebody a caretaker who was going to take care of all your property, your whole family, everything you own. And you had to choose such an individual. I suppose that you would do your work very carefully on examining the, any candidate who would come forward to take this position. But, and that is your necessary part in the process. But when you would choose that caretaker, the merit of yourself for believing him is not there. The merit is in the caretaker, and you are just recognizing that merit. And so when we, when we recognize the, uh, the value of God, when we recognize his faithfulness, that isn't because we have merit, it's because he has merit. And so that we just recognize his merit. So it follows, therefore, if, you, if your lack of faith, your lack of faith may not be because you lack merit. It's just because you have not put in the time and the effort to examine his merits. And fact number three uh, is that God quite often cannot answer the prayer that um, goes something like this. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread, or whatever it is that your request is. This kind of a hypothetical dependent on the answer in order to uh, place your faith in Him is a stumbling block that many people uh, experience. Um, God often cannot uh, answer those kinds of prayers, but sometimes he does. And I'm living proof of that. Um, my very first prayer, spoken from an atheistic mind, but a wondering heart, was just such a challenge to God. And he answered me in a most remarkable way. And I believe Thomas's prayer was of the same variety. Um, let's go to John 20, starting with verse 24. I'm going to go through verse 29. John 20, uh, starting with verse 24, and the Bible says, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, 
which means twin, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the prints of the nails, and put my finger into the prints of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Jesus, then Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they who have not seen, and yet have believed. Most of you are probably familiar with this story, and it is this story that has uh, resulted in the term Doubting Thomas. But I rise to the defense of my namesake. Um, Thomas was a doubter, all right, but not exceptionally so. None of the other disciples believed before they saw either. Thomas was the only one who was not cowering in the upper room when Jesus came the first time. Whatever else you may think of Thomas, he was no coward. But he must have had his feelings hurt by the fact that Jesus would come at a time when he was not there. Do you ever feel left out when you see God move in somebody else's life and he does not happen to move on yours? But I really believe that his statement, uh, I won't believe unless, was not a cry of cynicism. It was an earnest desire to be able to believe. And that is the difference between his statement and the statement of Satan or the statement of the, uh, of the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 12, 38 and 39. It says, And then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. There have been signs all around them, all the time. But they said, We want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. I remember a, a survey uh, taken by a popular science magazine, which I used to enjoy. Um, it's a very uh, atheistic uh, magazine. It's got a, got a lot of good science in it, but it's also very atheistic. And um, they sent out a survey to uh, scientists, uh, to people who had advanced science degrees. They got a list and they sent it out. And they uh, asked, I, the purpose of which was to find out how many scientists were atheists, and they thought they would get a big response of atheistic scientists, because everybody knows scientists are atheists, and that's not, not so, as we're going to find out here. And this was the biased question that they asked. Do you believe in a personal God who, if you asked for him something right now, he would give it to you? And then they triumphantly announced afterwards that only 40% believed in such a God. Um, the remarkable thing about that is that I think, in, in my opinion, if you asked uh, people in this congregation that same question and then that same way, you would got, not get 40% who would agree with that statement. 
because it's an erroneous kind of a statement. Nevertheless, the fact that they got 40% of scientists who would, uh, who would agree to that statement is proof that not all scientists are atheists by any means. And uh, in fact, uh, they have never re uh, referred to that survey again uh, because they would like you to think that all scientists are atheists. Uh, matter of fact, we just did a demographic study of, of Bend in preparation for our uh, evangelistic meetings. And they find that in Bend, only 22% of people have any belief in God whatsoever. And only about half of those are within uh, the type that might respond to our message. So we have an uphill climb. But that would indicate that twice as many scientists as the average Bendite uh, believe in God. But the, but the question, I think, is, is indicative of a way that a lot of people think that prayer, does it work? You know, in other words, if you, if you do your part, will God follow through always? And that makes him uh, your servant rather than your master. I believe that God is too wise a parent to give us everything that we ask. We need to love him for who he is and not what he gives. Earthly parents who have not learned this lesson often find that their children's love becomes conditional on continued gifts. Jesus sometimes told people he healed to tell no one. You know, Jesus was not anxious to be known primarily as a miracle worker. He wanted people to listen to him, to hear the, the words of life. He wanted to give them something far more important than their, their, their daily needs. And yet he was, he was compassionate and he gave people what they wanted uh, most of the time. Um, he can't bribe us to love him. If faith is conditional on receiving gifts, he can't give it. We need to have the attitude, I believe, help thou mine unbelief, because that also is a gift from God. Matthew 7, 7 is a, one, of the, one of the texts um, that is primary in, in why we need to pray. And it is, uh, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Now, there's an obvious progression here. Asking is somewhat passive. Seeking is a little more active. And knocking implies coming up against obstacles and knocking them down. But asking, let's go over asking. Asking is only a small part of prayer. Um, repentance and contrition Contrition are the gates. Adoration and praise open the throne room of God where comfort and closeness are found. Only then are we able to yield our faulty will up to the perfect will of God. Fully knowing that His will and our will do not always coincide. One of the best gifts He can give us is to be a willing participant in the working out of his plans. That those plans include our communion with him and the expression of our heart's desire is without question when we understand his nature. When we come into his presence with adoration and praise, sometimes we can even forget what we came there to ask for because we just lay ourselves down at his feet and let him take care of our needs. 
Seeking goes well beyond asking. Seeking means to go in search of, to do something, to pursue. It implies effort on our part. The issue, however, becomes in what it is that we are seeking. Jeremiah 29, 13, you're very familiar with, I'm pretty sure. And ye shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Amen. And that same thing is true of the other things that we desire. Whatever it is that you are seeking for, it needs to be a wholehearted uh, search. If we are only searching for the gifts, we are of ourselves. If he would give you what you want under that circumstance, it may remove from you the one unmet desire that is really a hunger for peace with God, well disguised as a physical or emotional need. God already knows what we need. Our repetitive asking is not for the purpose of increasing his willingness to give. It is sharpening our desire to receive. God can only give you what you truly want with all your heart. And, you know, if we want both health and to take most of our meals at McDonald's, something has to give. So we need to to repeat that choice over and over again, not to nag him into doing something, but to really prepare our hearts for the answer that he wants to give. And that is hard for some people to understand. Let's go back, though, to repentance and contrition, contrition which I said was the, the gates of prayer. But it's not easy to desire that. The most that most of us can, be, can do is to be willing to, be, uh, to desire repentance. Because repentance is not a, uh, a painless experience. Repentance is not an easy thing. But God will give you the gift of repentance Acts 5.31 says, Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So he not only gives you the repentance, he gives you the answer to your sins. And repentance then becomes joy uh, after we receive the answer. But I've got to say that repentance is disappearing from a lot of churches in our day. Uh, because the churches ask, what's so good about feeling bad? And uh, it's a question that's asked by many churches when they try to reach people by making them feel okay about themselves. I'm okay, you're okay. Come as you are, don't change. God likes you just the way you are. God likes you just the way they are, but he wants to lead you on to something greater. And the, the biggest uh, problem with the church in our day, according to scripture, is that we are rich and increased with goods and we have need of nothing when we are really poor and miserable and blind and naked. And we don't have a sense of what we need. We need to pray to God that he will give us a sense of what we truly need. We need to repent. You know, I, I was just moved by uh, reading uh, Ezra uh, just the other day. And Ezra and, and the, all the people just repented deeply, not for things that they did, but for what the people who had remained uh, did and they intermarried and they had gone astray from God and yet they took it on themselves. We need to have this sense of corporate uh, of repentance where we need to take on each other's problems. We are put in families for that reason. We are called together as a church to share each other's burdens and to 
really reprint on behalf of somebody else. What an awesome possibility that God has given us. God is the ultimate seeker. He's the one who sought out Adam after Adam's great sin. When God asked Adam, where are you? He wasn't asking for information. He was seeking to instill a recognition in Adam about where he was. Adam had two choices. He could repent or he could seek excuses. And he chose the excuses. As I said, adoration and praise bring us into the presence of God. But they can't be said to work in the ordinary sense of causing something to happen. Adoration and praise are a natural response to the recognition of God's goodness and grace. God does not need his ego fed by hearing our flattery. But he does delight in our praise because he knows what that does for our receptiveness to him. We often think of prayer as an attempt to move God. But it's really for the purpose of moving ourselves toward him. If it will not serve that purpose, then God might be doing us harm to answer our prayers. Prayer is an exercise in developing our choice muscle. We need to focus our choices. In the passage that uh, Marco read, it mentions fasting. This has gone pretty much out of style in churches today, but it does have a place. It isn't that God wants you to suffer. It's not a form of penance. It is a way of focusing on that one thing. We take the extraneous away. We get rid of the, uh, of the physical and we just focus on the spiritual and on the very thing that we want. And we uh, fast for the purpose of uh, making that supreme concentration and having a clear mind. Knocking. You know, God quite often, almost always, requires some kind of a physical step of faith. Um, he usually does with me, at any rate. Uh, and, you know, we need that, that determination to have the gifts of God. Um, you know, God seems to admire people who had that, that stubborn insistence on being uh, part of God's family as we talked about in Sabbath school this morning where Tamar, she was insistent on being part of the family of God and so she did what it took to make it happen Rahab um, you know, she did what it took to be part of the family of God, Ruth and, and this has been repeated over and over the reason that the people of God are called Israel is for one reason. Jacob wasn't such a great character other than that one night where he had this struggle with God and he said, I will not let you go except you bless me. There is some, there is a place for this kind of knocking on God's door. There is a place for this insistence on having the rights. But this is not to say that you can insist on having your way in every little, in every little thing that you think of. This is for the important thing, for being part of God's family. And it is this stubborn insistence that we are going to need in the end time. Because we are all going to go through Jacob's trouble. And Jacob's trouble is just this. That you're going to realize that you're worthless. That you have nothing to commend yourself to God. You're going to realize that you have failed and fallen. You're going to realize 
that your life has been mostly wasted. And you're going to feel like you don't deserve heaven. Hang on. Hang on. That is the most important thing you can do at that time. Because that is what made Israel part of the family of God. And every man, woman, and child who has been born into the family of God since then needs that grim determination to hold on no matter who plucks their feather or who criticizes their outfit or who uh, insults them in some dreadful way. Because if you are vulnerable to the insults of others, Satan is going to make sure that you get insulted. I want to move on to the idea of empirical evidence because that's when I, when I did a search on, I googled it and, you know, does prayer work and you got mostly cynics on there and they're criticizing Christians for believing in prayer and saying, you know, that uh, it can't be proven to work. And of course, um, they, I did find some that uh, established that uh, there are favorable results from prayer. Um, for instance, an article published by the Journal of Social and Clinical Psychology had this to say about prayer. There is some evidence that religiosity is similarly, uh, similarly related to several positive relationship outcomes, specifically greater involvement in religious activities, including prayer, is related to higher levels of marital satisfaction and marital stability, and three longitudinal studies indicate that religiousness predicts lower risk of divorce and divorce proneness, and on and on about how you know it does seem to uh, correlate with improved lives. And uh, but they say then that all that proves is that uh, religious people tend to be religious. And <laughs> <laughs> and they put almost everything down to the placebo effect. And, uh, you know, scientists reject anecdotal evidence anyway. So, and you can't really isolate um, prayer from other factors. But I suppose we could try an experiment. We could do, um, we could go down to the hospital and then we'd pray for everyone in one third of the rooms. Every third room we'd pray for. And uh, every second room, I mean, and then one third of the rooms, uh, we would only make them think we were praying for them. <laughs> so that we could measure the placebo effect. And then one third of the rooms, we wouldn't pray for them at all or even let them think so. So that we could have a control group. Um, there's obvious flaws in that. After all, can we as Christians only really choose, really want only one third of the people to be healed? That, that can't be our motive and still, we would not be really praying for the healing of the people. We'd be praying for God to demonstrate himself in some way for, so that we can be justified in our uh, belief in him. And that would not be an appropriate thing to do. Uh, Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep. He didn't say, uh, go and uh, try experiments on my rats. <laughs> and God doesn't need any help from us to show his power. You know, if he wanted to, he could write his name in blazing letters across the sky. And I used to wonder why he didn't do that. But there is such a thing as rules of engagement. I talked about that one time here. And there are some things that God probably could do, but that he won't. Faith, 
is something that has to be based on relationship. It can't be based on coercive evidence, uh, or it is not really faith. And it really doesn't work anyway. Um, whenever he gives us an answer to prayer, I, I also notice that he uh, leaves enough um, room uh, that you could hang a doubt on it if you wanted to. That's the nature of choice. And that is the big important factor in the great controversy. You know, and, and going back to the initial questions of why does God need our advice? Uh, why do we have to inform Him of what we need? Uh, are we persuading Him to do something that He would not do otherwise? Um, and, you know, the answer to that is yes, uh, it, is, it is true. Um, that uh, God does, in answer to the prayer of faith, do things that he would not do otherwise. I uh, found that in great controversy. I can't remember a page. I'm sorry. But it is, it is absolutely true that he does. And I think that a lot of people don't understand that the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. When God in the Garden of Eden gave man dominion. He never took it back. We have dominion of this planet, except to the extent that we have yielded that dominion to Satan, who claims to be the prince of this world. But he was not designed to be the prince of this world. You were designed to be the prince of this world. And what we choose matters a great deal. And much that God would like to do in this world he is waiting for us to choose it so that he can do it. Because this is our world. And the, the whole purpose of the, of the plan of redemption is to prove that man can uh, be part of God's heavenly kingdom once again. And so we must make the choices. And God honors those choices. Uh, and you know, one of the most remarkable things to me, an astounding thing, is that we can pray for the forgiveness of somebody else. That's astounding to me. James 5.5, 5, 5.15 5, that is. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Intercessory prayer is not an empty exercise. I may have told you this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. It's an important story to me. One time I, I got concerned about my son, Thomas. Not because Thomas has ever done anything wrong. He's a better man than I am. But that, you know, I just... I had a burden on my heart. I wanted to pray for Thomas. And uh, so I made an appointment with myself. I went out in the woods and I set my Bible up and, and got all ready for a long prayer. And I was planning to spend the day there if necessary. And I started my prayer Oh, Lord, please forgive Thomas. Done! I mean, it wasn't uh, an actual voice, but I had this, this strong, urgent, just absolute assuredness that it was absolutely done. And, um, you know, I don't think that bypasses Thomas's choice. Nevertheless, you know, Job prayed for his sons and daughters, and uh, apparently they will be in the kingdom with him. Uh, don't neglect to pray for one another, for your forgiveness, for whatever. He promises he will save your children. And, you know, I think that our, our choice... Uh, not only has a direct effect, but it has an indirect effect. Because when I was in the army, 
uh, and I was an atheist, I was aware that my mother was praying for me. And the only way that I could be aware that my mother was praying for me was if my mother was praying for me. Because the Holy Spirit can't tell lies. And so the Holy Spirit was revealing to me that my mother was praying for me. It had an influence on my behavior. It had an influence perhaps on, on my eventual choice to read the Bible. And it, uh, and it, it had a wonderful result as far as I'm concerned. But uh, it is just such an important part of what we do to pray for one another. So, in summary, does prayer work? Of course it does. But, you know, it's not really any more strange that my prayers should uh, affect the course of events than that my other actions should do so. 1 Corinthians 12, 31 says, But covet earnestly the best gifts. I suggest to you that he is the best gift. He promises to give us the Holy Spirit. Many people have prayed for the Holy Spirit. But I would suggest to you that if you have been praying for the Holy Spirit with the idea that you might be able to use him, then maybe you have your the shoe on the wrong foot. We need to bring ourselves to God to give ourselves to the Holy Spirit so that He can use us. And then He can give us the gift of the Holy Spirit and it will influence our whole life and our whole influence on our uh, ourself and our families. Part of the uh, quote that's in uh, our bulletin there is from Steps to Christ. What a wonder it is that we pray so little. God is ready and willing to hear the sincere prayer of the humblest of his children. Why should the sons and daughters of God be reluctant to pray when prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence? Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of prayer. We thank you that you pray for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. We thank you that you already know our needs, but that you delight in giving us our requests. Lord, help us to utilize the gift of prayer in a way that can glorify you and that can benefit ourselves and our families. Lord, we ask for a heart like Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen.